Hi, I'm Chuck Olenek. I'm a reenactor. And for 36 years, I used living history in the classroom to lure my students into thinking that the subject was cool, that it was a lot more interesting than looking up dates and dead people. And to that end, I would dress for the time period and use that living history thing that I'm into. I would bring in the music for the time period so I could have a soundtrack to history. I would bring in stuff for my students to handle because touching history makes it more real. And I'm not in the classroom anymore. I had to find a way to repurpose myself. So what I decided to do was take a deep dive into an area that had interested me but I didn't really have the time before to research it. I found out I was woefully ignorant about some parts, and that's California history. So to that end, I ended up visiting all of the California missions, 23, not 21, and the Asistencias, those are spin-off missions or places that were intended to be spin-off missions, and Presidios, fortifications to protect the missions. And it led me into looking at the Mexican-American War and how California became a part of the Union. That's led to some other uh, topics and one of those happens to be about the outlaws or the, ben I was saying banditos but I guess more properly banditi that sprang up as a result of A, California becoming part of the United States and B, the gold rush. So what I did previously was I took a look at the bandito Joaquin Murrieta and I tried to sort fact from myth, which is quite a chore. Well, Murrieta had a partner he briefly ran with, uh, Solomon Pico. He's from a very famous California family. He's the black sheep of that family. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at uh, Pico's career. I hope you stick with me on my journey. Solomon Pico was a member of the Picos, a prominent California family, which included Pio Pico, who would serve as the last Mexican governor of Alta California, and Andres, who would command the Mexican forces in California during the Mexican War. He was born on the Rancho del Rey San Pedro near Salinas and baptized at Mission San Juan Batista. His father, Jose Dolores Pico, was a soldado with the Presidio of Monterey and had two more sons and moved on to manage the King's Ranch or Rancho del Rey, which provided food, leather, and other supplies to the Presidio. Solomon spent his early life on Rancho del Rey, which stopped being called that when Mexican independence was achieved in his birth year, but returned to Monterey Pueblo with his mother when his father died. Monterey at that time was the capital of Alta California, and here Solomon was exposed to education and international influences unavailable on the rancho. In 1840, Pico married Juana Vazquez at Mission Santa Cruz. They made their first home in Monterey, where children began arriving regularly. And four years later, Pico received a Mexican land grant of 58,000 acres somewhere near the Stanislaus River and the San Joaquin River in what is now Stanislaus County. He fought with the Mexican army against the United States during the Mexican-American War, serving as a scout and a soldado. By the time California had been annexed to the United States, Solomon was probably back on his ranch with his family. With a population of around 10,000 non-Indians in the territory of California, it was still a small community in 1847. In 1848, gold was discovered at Sutter's Mill. In August of that year, the effects of gold fever hit Pico's land grant. He was constantly trying to chase off squatters that flooded his land. Uh, he took his wife to Monterey because she was ill and she died there. So he's left with nothing. These are the Solomon Hills behind me. 
they're named for Solomon Pico. And of course the spelling's gonna be a little different now. Uh, but I'm standing at, basically this would be the northern extent of where Solomon Pico tended to operate. I'm at Rancho Nipomo, actually at the Dana Adobe, and pretty much from this point on south into those hills and along the Camino Real, that's where Solomon Pico operated when he vowed vengeance for having lost his wife through an illness and lost his land because people coming in to look for gold were squatting on his land in such numbers he couldn't get rid of them. So he moved south to this area which had no mining in the southern part of the state and um, the counties were disparagingly referred to as the cow counties. That's gonna change big time because what's gonna end up happening is all these people that have flooded into the state that are in the gold fields, they're going hungry. And all of a sudden, the, the value of the cattle has changed. Cattle were raised before mostly for the hide and tallow trade that was mentioned in the book two years before the mast. But now people are going hungry. And there's the one part of economics that I've learned and remembered, supply and demand, okay? Whereas I know that at a Monterey Rancho in the early 1850s, so we're talking Solomon Pico's time here, uh, uh, you know, head of cattle would cost maybe, I think $10 at the outside, more likely five. They weren't going for that much. Well, maybe it was a lot back then, but compared with the new price, people are hungry. The cattle are now being raised for meat. And so you're looking at maybe $79 a head. So this is a big profit that can be made. So you have people coming from the gold fields and they're carrying bags of gold dust. And Solomon Pico, he's adopted one identity or one job during the day. By day, he's a stock dealer. He is buying and selling cattle. But at night, He's going to switch to another identity, kind of like Zorro. At night, he is able to hunt down these people that are carrying the gold. And they're coming down in parties of two or three. And they're not really thinking it's that big a deal. Well, these parties of two or three tended to disappear. And sometime later, Skeletons would be found in the thickets, uh, skulls would have bullet holes in them, and this was a way for Pico to gain revenge on uh, what he considered that the Anglo-Americans have done to him and to his life. And he becomes a very popular hero amongst uh, the Californios, the native-born Californians, because He's sticking it to the man. And he was apparently very lavish with uh, the gold that he picked up. And he was very popular to the point where if he was being hunted, all he had to do was knock on someone's door and ask for shelter. And people would let him in and he could ride his horse right into the house. And that confused posses terribly because the posses that are hunting him are going to be looking for his horse outside and they don't see a horse so he was able to evade capture many times by the way there's gonna be a real grim story that's been attached to pico's name he supposedly went off to when he met somebody he supposedly cut off their ear and 
added it to a string and some people said he wore this you know grizzly set of trophies like a necklace or he had these ears attached to a string of leather or leather thong and it would hang from his saddle and most pretty much there's no contemporary accounts that said this guy did this there's a novel that was written or a, a story that was written about 1829 um, by a guy named Bancroft and he was writing about an outlaw or bandido named uh, Domingo Hernandez who operated from Monterey on north who was supposed to have done these things but you know hey people had to try to find ways to besmirch Pico's name there's a temptation to lump several of the banditi together and just say yeah it's all one story uh, these guys were basically Zorro figures actually they're all supposed to be the inspiration behind Zorro according to some who were fighting the good fight and it was a fight against Anglo oppression and well really it's all the same story no it's not uh, you there's a real tendency to just say oh Solomon Pico is simply you know a knockoff of Joaquin Murrieta no they have different backgrounds they have different motivations Joaquin Murrieta moved from Mexico he started as a miner he wasn't guaranteed a rich living his uh, claims were taken from him you know he was chased off of them you know his wife was raped or not depending on which story you listen to you know his half-brother was lynched or not depending on which story you listen to and he led a very successful outlaw band and at one point he had teamed up with Solomon Pico Solomon Pico came from a very different background he came from in essence, the nobility of Alta California. He was part of the Pico family. He just happened to be the black sheep of the Pico family. He had a rancho. He had wealth. He lost it. He was unable to hold back the sea of squatters that showed up because of the gold rush. Murrieta was part of the gold rush. And so... The idea of Pico, who obviously was an embarrassment to the rest of the family, by day he lived an honest life. At night, there was the other side. Pico didn't uh, really run afoul of county officials that often, but on one occasion, the uh, sheriff of Santa from Santa Barbara was riding to a rancho to deliver a writ and he and Pico ran into each other. Not up close, they were at a bit of a distance. Pico was seeing a lone rider and he thought, hey, this is a victim. And then what ended up happening is the sheriff recognized Pico and they spent hours trying to outmaneuver each other because what Pico was trying to do, he'd been waiting on the trail, now he's trying to get behind this lone figure, and the sheriff is like, oh no, no, if he gets behind me, I'm dead. So they played this game for hours, until finally the sheriff identified himself, and because he recognized Pico, and he told Pico, my advice to you, is to go away and Pico once he realized that this wasn't just some lone traveler this was a sheriff and apparently he was a very formidable man Pico got out of pistol range waved adios and left 1851 seems to be the 
peak of Kiko's career as a bandito. And things are gonna change for him. He's immensely popular with the people. People will cover his tracks. Uh, they will hide him. They, if he was arrested for something, charges would often get dropped or he would be acquitted because if it was a trial by jury, the majority of people in the area were Californios. But things are gonna change for him. In June of 1851, there was a mail carrier who's traveling from Monterey to Los Angeles, and he's murdered. And a bunch of volunteers, in true vigilante fashion, mount up and they go looking for the murderers. And they arrest Pico, and by the way, I've never found out if he actually did anything in this or not. They arrested uh, a, an Anglo-American, and they arrested members of Pico's gang, and basically whoever else they could get their hands on. And a vigilante court found them all guilty, and they were all supposed to be uh, hung in true vigilante fashion. And because Pico has influence, I mean, he's related to famous people, um, and his family is a very high standing in the state, he manages to get off, and so does everyone that has been arrested except for the Anglo-American, who the vigilantes decided, no, we're gonna enforce what our court found. And they broke into the jail, hung him, and then put him up on the jail door. Pico realized, this is an example. I'm leaving. And he's going to head south towards Los Angeles. Pico moved south to Los Angeles. And there he was protected by a lot of the local Californios who looked upon him as a hero. After all, he seemed to be fighting the good fight against the Anglo oppressors, and uh, they were perfectly willing to hide him and to aid him. Well, while Pico was living in Los Angeles, Joaquin Murrieta showed up there, and he, had, he and his group had been uh, captured by Indians, they had been robbed, they had been stripped, and Pico and his people got to a, a hideout uh, house that they had, and they got themselves uh, reclothed, and they got themselves rearmed, and now Pico and Murrieta team up, and they rampage all over Los Angeles County. Robbery, theft, murder, you know. They're having a field day. And at one point, they take, they take it upon themselves to attempt the assassination of a judge they didn't care for, uh, Judge Benjamin Ignatius Hayes. And there was a little problem. The person they tried to assassinate was a Judge uh, J.S. Mallard. A case of mistaken identity. And oops. They did end up conducting a successful assassination though at Mission San Gabriel itself, which had been secularized, and there were, uh, you know, shops and saloons that were actually in the mission proper. And um, the owner of one of these uh, was a you know, former Major General, and his last name was Bean. He's the older brother of Judge Roy Bean, you know, right, big time famous Western judge. Well, there was a dispute about, uh, some people say he was mistreating a, uh, you know, California girl. Others say, no, that wasn't the case. 
it doesn't matter. They ended up murdering him. All right. And the Vigilance Committee in Los Angeles went insane. And they were hunting down the killers and um, I think in the process, Murrieta was wounded in the arm. Uh, both he and Pico got away, but four were captured and one of them was an in-law of uh, Murrieta's, um, Reyes Feliz, and he spilled his guts. Well, he ended up being lynched by uh, the Vigilance Committee and uh, because hey, he confessed to some stuff. Never mind that he didn't confess to the killing of uh, Major General Bean, but he confessed to some crimes, so okay, they executed him. And um, they also killed two of Solomon uh, Pico's people. But, you know, as far as, you know, Pico and Murrieta, they get away. Murrieta goes north, Pico goes south. Solomon Pico moved to Baja, California. There he ran into Jose Castro, who was the military commandant for the frontier area, and he appointed Pico as a captain. And there he was kind of undergoing a change of heart. He actually stopped a lynch mob uh, that was determined to lynch four Americans. That had to have been a big transformation for him. However, in April of 1860, Castro was murdered and Castro's successor decided he was going to clean up the area and he rounded up 15 outlaws or former outlaws and had them executed and Solomon Pico was one of them. No one really knows what happened to all the gold, you know, but there's plenty of rumors going around that in these hills somewhere gold is hidden from Pico's exploits. Okay, we covered Solomon Pico. I hope you stick with me as I continue chasing banditi and lawmen.